and welcome here to the to the Swift Current Museum. My name is uh, is Lloyd Begley. I'm the museum director, and and I think this is about our 85th or 86th installment of Lunch and Learn that we began way back in November of uh, 2011. And today, our guest speaker, she's going to talk to us about the history of the Red River cart and how it participated in the evolution of transportation processes in the course of the 19th century. Please join me in welcoming Barb Parchman, a Métis historian, to our stage. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Barb. I'm the Curatorial and Operations Assistant at the Art Gallery of Swift Current. I'm also um, a Métis woman and a Métis historian. I've done um, research over several years on the history of Métis in Southwest Saskatchewan. And um, so today I'll talk about Red River Carts. Um, I'll talk about the history and then I'll kind of advance to the present day. This is a full-size um, cartwheel. It's five feet six inches high. Um, it was made for a cart that was commissioned for the art gallery from Jerome Cartworks in Oak Bank, Manitoba. And uh, this cart was commissioned for a project I did uh, in 2017. Um, it was a partnership with the Swift Current Museum, and we had this cart built for it. Um, the cart was made from oak, and the hubs were made from ash, and um, all the wood comes from the Red River area in Manitoba. Armin's been building these carts for over 20 years and has actually rode some on several of the historic trails in Manitoba and Saskatchewan and I'll explain a little bit more about them later. Um, he's making his carts to the specifications from original carts made 125 years ago. The only thing he's added is the belting around the outside to help protect the wheels, and there is some graphite on the hubs, but they're made uh, with no nail constructions. On this side is a half-size cart that I had uh, commissioned the same year. This one was made by George Fiant in Regina. He's a Métis cart builder, and um, he makes his carts from recycled fur from grain elevators. A lot of uh, Métis worked on the construction of grain elevators uh, back when when it was a big business. So this is made. This fur or this the fur is softer, obviously, than the oak in that. This one was made for demonstration purposes and workshops. Um, I take it to schools and I was at Seanvin Art Camp last summer with it. Yeah, there's the full-size cart. Um, that's a picture of it when I picked it up in uh, Manitoba in 2017. This uh, half-size cart, um, this, is, uh, this was taken at the Seanvin Art Camp last summer and the kids had a blast with it. So, for now, I'll talk about the cart history um, and the role that the Red River carts played in building Canada. Um, the carts were an important contribution to the development of the prairie economy. And the carts kind of had three phases of industry. They were first used for carrying uh, buffalo meat home from the hunts. Um, and then they became an integral part of the fur trade until the commercialization of the industry completely wiped out the buffalo herds. Uh, then they turned to other wildlife and, um, and caused some more um, decimation. They also freighted a lot of merchandise from the east to the west and from the south in Montana to north in Canada. And um, that is until the railways arrived and caused the demise of the cart freighting history, basically. So they were really uh, mostly active during the 1800s, but they definitely had an influence on the uh, building of Canada. So the carts were initially used to bring back meat from buffalo hunts. The hunts were often colossal in size uh, when there was lots of buffalo on the prairies. According to Alexander Ross from his book, The Red River Settlement, on the 15th of June, 1840, carts were seen to emerge from every nook and corner of the settlement bound for the plains. From Fort Gary, the cavalcade and camp followers went crowding onto the public road, and thence, stretching from point to point, till the third day in the evening when they reached Pembina, the great rendezvous on such occasions. Here the roll was called and general muster taken, when they numbered on this occasion 1,630 souls. 
And here, the rules and regulations for the journey were finally settled. The officials for the trip were named and installed into office, and all without the aid of writing materials. So the buffalo hunts were well organized and almost followed uh, military, um, like they had a whole um, lineup of people who were delegated to certain tasks on the job, and all that was done before they headed off on the hunt. So the camp occupied as much ground as a modern city and was formed in a circle. All the carts were placed side by side, the trains outward. These are trifles, yet they are important to our subject. Within this line of circumval circumvallation, the tents were placed in double treble rows at one end, the animals at the other in front of the tents. This is in order in all dangerous places, but where no danger is apprehended, the animals are kept on the outside. Thus, the carts formed a strong barrier, not only for securing the people and their animals within, but as a place of shelter against an attack of the enemy without. And so um, this is uh, a picture of the number of carts um, leaving uh, the Red River settlement on the semi-annual <laughs> buffalo hunt. They would hunt in the spring and then uh, in the fall and winter. And um, so you can see the number of carts, how they grew from 1820 to 1840. In 1820, there was 540 carts that went out on the trek. In 1840, there was 1,210. Once the fur trade expanded inland, away from the rivers, where voyagers traveled with furs and trade goods, the Métis began developing a wide network of trading routes across the prairies, using routes that were based on Indian trails, which were often buffalo trails. Métis craftsmen from the Red River settlement crafted the Red River carts to adapt to the prairie trails and became a well-known symbol of Métis culture and their nomadic way of life. Eventually, the Métis and their versatile carts played a major role in the commercialization of the buffalo hunt, sadly to the point of eradicating the millions of buffalo from the prairies in a matter of about 10 years. Uh, commercial trails were, um, the, the map isn't really easy to see, but the commercial trails were from Pembina in North Dakota to Red River, uh, Pembina to St. Paul, Minnesota, Red River to Fort Ellis, uh, in Saskatchewan, and uh, Red River to Carleton, and, and Fort Carleton to Fort de Prairie, which was Edmonton. The card industry grew exponentially. In 1869, it was reported that at least 2,500 carts had passed through St. Cloud, Minnesota, carrying, 1600, or carrying 600 tons of freight for the Hudson's Bay Company. So as you can see, there were many trails throughout Saskatchewan. Uh, the trails came in from the east, from the west, north, south. The Battleford Trail Ruts Municipal Heritage Site beside Houston Pizza has Red River cart ruts embedded into the earth. And uh, it was an important trade route between Swift Current and Battleford in the late 1800s. It was used as a freight route by Métis who collected buffalo bones and after the demise of the buffalo. Um, and this provided Swift Current with its first commercial export. And the trail was strategic during the 1885 resistance. Troops and supplies came by train to Swift Current and then were sent north on the trail. Many uh, local Métis didn't join the resistance because they were still making good money freighting. By 1890, the railroad had reached Saskatoon and Red River cart freighting was on the decline. The final um, large-scale freighting duties for the Métis and their carts were to haul buffalo bones um, after the buffalo had been decimated. The hides were sold for tanning while the carcasses were allowed to rot, and all that remained was a scattering of bones across the land. When the Northwest Mounted Police made their historic march west in 1874, they reported seeing the plains covered in buffalo. The North American buffalo population was believed to be well over 50 million at that time. Ten years later, in 1884, the wild herds had completely vanished. 
U.S. and Canadian governments did nothing to stop the slaughter, believing the extinction of the buffalo would make it easier to manage Indigenous populations and easier for relegating Indian people to the reservations. An estimate of carloads of bones shipped from Saskatoon alone represents 60 million pounds of bones from about 750,000 buffalo. The bones were sold for use in sugar processing, for, to make bone china, uh, for making fertilizer and buttons. By 1812, the trails had spread across the west, radiating from Red River to points west and south. By the 1850s, organized brigades of carts had made the 885-kilometer journey from Fort Garry to St. Paul. Uh, Métis caravans of trains, uh, this is from Franklin Blackwell Mayer, uh, with pen and pencil on the frontier in 1837. Uh, Métis caravans or trains have annually increased in number and now 200 carts make yearly pilgrimage across the prairies, 650 miles to St. Paul. They are laden with buffalo hides, pemmican, peltries, fur, embroidered leather coats, moccasins, saddles, and these they sell or exchange in St. Paul and then return again to their secluded home. He was saying, so this was about 1837 that uh, Franklin Mayer had made these observations. So most experienced freighters could handle 10 carts in a caravan, though the normal was six and the minimum being about three carts at a time. And um, I would think they'd have to have some really good animals to be able to keep those carts going in a caravan. Um, in contrast, a teamster could only handle two wagons with ease. So, um, cart construction. In 1801, Alexander Henry reported his Métis employees were using carts with solid one-piece wheels. By September 20th of, 1880, of 1802, he would see them using a new design. The wheels are about four feet high and perfectly straight, he says. The spokes are perpendicular without the least bending outward, and only four spokes to each wheel. These carts carry about five pieces of 90 pounds and are drawn by only one horse. So these are from the manuscripts of Alexander Henry and David Thompson. The carts were made entirely from wood with no nails in the construction. Shag nappy, or rawhide strips, were used to tie the spindles together for a rail around the outside of the cart. And the carts originated in the Red River settlement, and builders used solid oak to make the carts. The hubs were made from elm, ash, or birch. The wheels stood over five feet high and were dish-shaped, so they didn't sink as far and were easier to pull. The rails on the cart were about 14 feet long. Um, so George um, Fayant does presentations. He makes carts to various scales. This is a quarter scale cart, quarter or eighth, I think, scale cart. And um, he makes his with the, with the solid wheel. Um, and he talks about um, that the history of this cart is probably connected to like the Scotsman and that and carts that they would have made. And they brought those skills over uh, and implemented them here. And so the kids get to assemble these carts and custom paint them. The cart wheels. Says that you could hear the wheels for miles before you could see them. The wheels couldn't be oiled because dust would stick to the grease and affect the mobility of the carts and create wear and tear on the hubs. The wheels would create an ear-piercing screech as it traveled. The sound would be definite, deafening when you had several hundred carts on a trail. In 2017, when, um, when I had this cart commissioned, I got to ride on it, and uh, we actually went north of town and did some filming and, um, and rode up and down through the prairie hills there. And just the squeaking sound alone 
is noisy. I can't imagine listening to that squeal along with that. I would think that when they set up camp at night, the, the silence must have been deafening in a way, you know, and very enjoyable, I'm sure. So cart repairs, uh, the versatility of the carts was unmatched. The high wheels could navigate the prairie ruts. They could be disassembled and uh, floated by removing the wheels and lashing them to the bottom of the cart. They would do this to go across streams. If they had a longer portage, then they would uh, wrap the bottoms in uh, buffalo hides. Um, they could provide shelter by using saplings to form a frame over the cart and then covering the frame with hides. And when dozens of carts were encircled, they provided a portable corral for animals or security for the people inside the circle. In winter, the cart frame could be used as a sled pulled by a horse. Repairs were made using very simple tools. The hubs were usually brought along on the trip, um, especially if they were out here on the prairie, um, to try and find um, a big enough, uh, solid enough piece of hardwood might have been challenging. Um, but they would pick up um, other wood along the way to make their repairs. Um, and repairs, uh, shag nappy or even a Métis sash would be used uh, if, if, if a wheel broke down on the way, they could lash it together and, uh, and make it hold. And the rawhide strips, once they were wet, they would dry really tightly and form a strong bond. So the carts um, could be pulled uh, by horse or oxen. Pulling uh, a cart by a horse, a horse could carry a load of about 500 pounds and, uh, and could travel about 50 miles in a day. Um, with the oxen, the oxen could pull about 1,000 pounds, but they could only travel about 20 miles in a day. Eventually, they, they went to, um, converted over to horses. But when they first started, um, there was some uh, Métis in, um, in Selkirk that actually started raising oxen in order to provide animals for the carts. So uh, this is uh, Armand and Kelly Jerome, and uh, they are the cart builders that built the full-size cart for me. This picture was taken in Vancouver at, uh, I think it was a, maybe it was the Olympics actually, in Vancouver. They uh, were commissioned to build a cart for the Olympics. Um, and he's also been uh, riding the carts on various trails. Uh, I believe it was 2010 year of the Métis. Uh, they trailed from St. Norbert, Manitoba to Batoche. And um, he actually had talked to me once about um, wanting to do one of the trails in the southern half. And um, so maybe in a couple of years we'll, we'll have that project together. Um, this year he's going to be trailing um, they're doing a, a big trail in Manitoba, maybe from Winnipeg to Pembina. I can't remember exactly what he said, but... Uh, um, and the re there was a revival that started about 20 years ago. Um, Armand was part of a group from St. Norbert of uh, Métis uh, elders that, um, that formed this group and started building these carts and traveling them around. Um, he says, unfortunately, most of the members of that group have died now, and, um, and there's only a few. And so he gets help every once in a while from some of the, some of the other members of that group. So in uh, 2017, I put together kind of a multi-level program. Hugh Henry and I had talked about his upcoming Battleford Trail Walk. And he was musing that it would be great to have a Red River cart along for the trek. And I had been thinking about having a Red River cart built for the Battleford Trail site. Um, because it had always kind of irked me that someone had donated an old grain wagon and the parks department decided to set it up at that site. And every time I mentioned the, the Battleford Trail site, they would say, oh, where that old Red River cart is. And I would say, that's not a Red River cart. And um, so uh, the year that uh, he was doing his walk was also Canada 150. And I kind of wanted to draw attention to that site to, um, to bring awareness to people of the fact that Canada's history started long before 150 years ago. 
And um, so, uh, so I came up with this multi-layer program that involved a partnership between the museum and gallery, and, uh, and fortunately got a lot of grant funding through different cultural organizations. Um, it involved the commissioning of the two Red River carts, uh, and then um, the, the full-size cart went on the Battleford Trail trek the following morning, and a bunch of us walked along with it. Um, I couldn't uh, find anyone who could commit to going on the cart trek with uh, Hugh. And we turned around and came back, and, uh, and came back for this Métis culture camp that I put on at the Battleford Trail site. And I had um, Yvonne Chartrand, who's a, a master Métis jigger, uh, who has mentored under Johnny Arcand. Um, she came and danced, and Joseph Natalho, who most of you are familiar with. Um, and I had, I was fortunate to be able to hire Phil and Dallas Boyer, um, really good uh, fiddle and guitar, Métis fiddle and guitar players. So we did a lot of dancing and, um, and there was music. Um, George Fayant did a cart presentation out there. And uh, we actually had a youth group from uh, Mee Wasson uh, Métis group in Medicine Hat. They came down, they had heard Yvonne was gonna be there and they really wanted to meet her and learn jigging from her. So the cart, the half-size cart, um, George and I did a, a Culture Days 2017. We went to the joint school and did presentations, and that's the Catholic school kids putting it together. Often when he does these, um, he has the girls against the boys, and the girls always seem to be a little faster at putting the carts together. So another thing we tried that was a, a blast was um, uh, George came to the um, Art Gallery's art camp last summer out at Gowans Grove and, um, and decided that we would try floating a cart. So we floated the half-size cart with the tarp and the kids carried it across and it made it okay. Uh, we floated it a couple times. The second time it took on a little bit of water, but we got that out of there and, uh, and so they had a lot of fun with that. So this is the Battleford Trail site. Um, the, the horses and wagon you see there are uh, Dale Anderson's and he was our people mover that day so anyone that wanted to ride on the trek could, uh, could come back on that. Um, I'd like to finish the story. Um, I'd like to tell you a story about my great grandmother Ursula uh, Troche. Um, Ursula, my great grandmother, married Leo Peranto and that's a couple of their kids and that picture would have probably been taken at Lake Palshe. Uh, the, there was a Métis settlement south of Lake Palshe, and that's where my Métis roots come from. Um, eventually, actually it probably wasn't long after this that they uh, moved back down to Montana, and uh, they both passed away in uh, Chinook, Montana, I believe it was. And uh, part of the reason they went back there was um, because they would be recognized as Indians in the US and they had no recognition of anything in Canada and they felt like they might have more rights down there. So they went back down there. But there's still a very long drawn out um, uh, court case that's been going on for years and years uh, with, uh, they were part of the, what was called the landless uh, Chippewa tribe. And there's been this ongoing lawsuit where they're fighting for land that they uh, that they should have that should have been theirs years ago, um, and that's probably right around the Rocky Boy Reservation area. So um, my uh, great grandmother, her uh, parents were Jean Baptiste Trache and Rose McGillis, and um, and Jean Baptiste was a, a freighter. Uh, in his day. So Ursula's father was a freight master and owned several horses and carts and was a little better off than some. He had a contract to haul merchandise from Haver, Montana to Battleford, Saskatchewan. When Ursula was 12 years old, which I figure is about 1889, um, she drove a cart on one of these trips and told of the harrowing experiences she had. 
She was really scared going down the big hills at Little Muddy in the White Mud Valley and the South Saskatchewan River and the North Saskatchewan River Valley at Battleford. She would drive the carts down the hills with her eyes shut, crying all the way. They used to tie the wheels with shaganappy so they wouldn't go so fast as they were going down the hills, but it didn't seem to help. At the end of the trip, she received $2 and bought herself a pair of shiny rubbers. And uh, so I can only imagine what that trek would have been like for a 12-year-old because in these carts, you would be sitting on top of your load. And, uh, and I know just from sitting in the flat cart on the prairie just how tippy and everything it, it is, so you'd have to have a strong constitution. And to make that trek, I was going to figure out what the m miles were between Haver, Montana and Battleford, but, but uh, I can't imagine. I know Armand uh, Drome says that when they do these modern day treks, a lot of them put old car seats in the, in the carts just to make the ride a little nicer, I guess. And uh, um, so we have all those advantages now. I can't imagine what it would have been like back then.